Chapter 16. Nock and her parents stood in the temple courtyard, a sprawling jackfruit tree shielding them from the afternoon sun. Nock rolled a pebble back and forth across the dirt with the toe of her shoe, trying not to count the minutes. As sad as she felt about disturbing the last moments of Father Cham's life, she was anxious to get all of this underway. Her family had decided to wait, out of respect, but it was taking longer than expected. Nock looked at her mother. She seemed nervous, too, but pleased. Of course, her mother remembered the boy who'd nearly ruined their lives. His name was Pong, she had reminded Nock. Her voice edged with bitterness. It must be him. Yes, Nock agreed that it must. She had looked at the young monk's left wrist as he'd walked away from the village, but it was completely covered with string bracelets. That didn't matter. She didn't need to check for a tattoo to know it was him. She knew that Pong had recognized her, too. She wondered if right now he was begging the other monks for forgiveness or trying to lie his way out of this. It wouldn't do him any good. He was caught, and now he'd have to face the consequences. Nock's pulse beat faster as she thought of how news of the arrest would spread across the province. She pictured her mother's friends flicking their cards back and forth to one another across a polished dining table. Did you hear the latest about the Sivapan girl? She caught a fugitive hiding in plain sight. Thank goodness she was there. He might have gotten away with it forever. Her parents must be so proud. Nock paced beneath the tree, letting her eyes wander the temple grounds. Even at the height of the afternoon, the air was cool and breezy. The temple was so peaceful, it was hard to imagine that a dangerous runaway had been hiding here for the past four years. The groundskeeper, Mr. Baboon, shuffled toward them and bowed to Nock's parents. Brother Yam is ready to see you, Commissioner. Finally, muttered Nock's mother. As they followed after Mr. Baboon, a parrot flew out from the forest, chittering as it glided overhead. Nock tracked it over the temple buildings. It was a lucky bird, a nice thing to see on a day like this. It landed on the archway above the temple gate. Nock paused. She'd been the last one inside, and she remembered shutting the gate behind her. Now it hung open. A thin swirl of dust hovered inches above the ground. Heat rose up the side of her neck and pulsed into her cheeks. She grabbed her staff from where she'd left it, leaning against a wall, and sprinted out the gate. Nock called her father. Nock, where are you going? Nock didn't slow down. If she waited for her parents to rally the police, it would be too late. If she wanted Pong to be captured, she would have to do it herself. The forest formed a tunnel of green around her as she sped down the mountain road. I'm faster than him, thought Nock as her feet flew. There's only one road down the mountain, and it won't be long before I catch up to him. Nock jerked to a stop. She would catch up to him eventually, and unless he was a complete fool, he knew it too. Nock didn't think Pong was a fool. A fugitive didn't evade capture for four years by making stupid mistakes like that. She retraced her steps, walking backwards slowly, so silently that not even the dust knew that she was there. She calmed her breath so she could listen. For a moment, she heard nothing but distant birds. Then she heard the crack of a branch. It could be an animal, or it could be a boy. Nock scanned the forest to either side of her. Now that she was paying attention, she saw that she had run right past a path that led into the trees. Behind her, back at the temple, she could hear the hubbub of voices. She heard her father call her name again. She left the road and took the forest trail. She nothing stepped down a well-worn path through the trees. This must be one of the trails the monks used for their walking meditations. It began to wind down so steeply that she had to dig her staff into the ground to keep from skidding. Ahead, she heard the heavy crunch like two feet stumbling. Knock, froze. Then she heard a body crashing through leaves as if someone no longer cared about being quiet. Nock ran down the slope, using her staff to brace herself. Her heart pounded excitedly. This wasn't some spire-fighting drill at the gym. This was the real thing. But even though Nock's many years of training could, should have prepared her for this moment, she was scared. She was alone with a dangerous criminal. If something went wrong, there would be no teacher to stop the drill, no referee to call, step in and call a timeout. Nock was so distracted that she failed to notice that the forest path led straight into a sinkhole. She wheeled her arms, stopping herself just in time to keep from falling in. She looked up at the thick trees, then back down into the hole. This area was known to be full of caves. Pong must have gone down there. There was nowhere else for him to go. As Nock climbed down after him, she tried to steady her nerves. You can do this, she told herself. You've taken down much bigger boys than him before. Nock dropped onto the dusty floor of the cave and quickly took up her defense posture. Her eyes flicked side to side, taking in her surroundings. She stood inside a huge limestone room with a high ceiling. An enormous stone statue of the Buddha sat cross-legged and serene near one wall of the cave. If Nock hadn't been on her guard, she would have bowed in reference. It was a t breathtaking statue, carved in the old style by people who had lived here before the village, maybe even before the temple. Above the Buddha's head, a wide hole in the cave ceiling opened to the sky. 
Knox suddenly realized where she was. This was the famous Tanabury Cavern. The mouth of the cave opened out above the river. At noon, sunlight would pour in through the hole and make the Buddha statue appear to glow. It was past noon now, almost two o'clock, so the statue was already in shadow. Nock tore her eyes away from the statue and looked to the mouth of the cave. A boy's form stood silhouetted with the blue sky behind him. Stop right there, called Nock. Her voice is startling, uh, startling her as it rang off the limestone. She held her staff in front of her and took slow steps forward. Pong backed away toward the cave mouth. He held his shoulders hunched forward and his hands out in front of him. He looked scared. He should be. The drop down to the river below was more than 50 yards. There was nowhere for him to run. With a little leap in her stomach, Nock realized she truly had caught him. Stay where you are, she said, more confident now. If you come peacefully, you won't be hurt. Back to the temple, said Pong. Why? So you can put me in handcuffs? Nock straightened her staff in front of her, only if necessary. Pong took another step back. And then you'd take me back to Nam Wan, wouldn't you? Nock advanced slowly, confidently. Even though she was smaller than Pong, she felt like a giant. It was a rush, this feeling of being the bearer of justice. She wished that her parents were there to see her. Not Nam Wan, she said. You're too old to go back there now. You'll have a trial, and afterward, they'll send you to the men's prison, to Banglad. Pong shuddered. Suddenly, he leaped forward, trying to run past her, but Nock was too fast. She swung her staff down in front of him. It whistled a pale blur and then hit the stone with a loud crack, blocking his way. Flecks of loose limestone crumbled off the cave ceiling and rained onto her shoulders. She spun her staff again, forcing him back toward the ledge. As a girl, she wasn't supposed to touch a monk, much less attack one. But Pong was a fake. The rules didn't apply to him. Nock was prepared to do what she had to, even if it meant wrestling him to the ground. Pong's eyes flickered wildly. I'm not going to Banglad, he said, panting. I'm not going to any prison. I don't belong there. I didn't do anything wrong. You escaped, said Nock, holding her staff steady. You broke the law. A law that says kids have to live in a jail? You'd blame me for bre breaking a law like that? Do you realize that if you would have just stayed where you were, you'd be released by now, she said? You'd be free if you just followed the rules. The rules are stupid, Pong cried, so loud that it made Nock take a step back. And unfair. Call them whatever you want, said Nock, steadying her feet and her voice. You still have to follow them, otherwise what good are they? Pong was breathing hard. His head was bent and his shoulders curled in, as if he'd already been put in handcuffs. He looked at her from under his hairless brows. That's so easy for someone like you to say. Nock narrowed her eyes. What's that supposed to mean? It's easy for you to follow the law, said Pong flatly. It was written for people like you, for families like yours. How dare you talk about my family? Heat rushed to her temples. Her voice was rising, too. She sounded out of control, and she didn't like it. She tried to calm herself, but the words tumbled out of her mouth too fast. Yes, we follow the law because that's what good people do. Good people obey the rules, and if they don't, they accept their punishment. You don't get to break the law just because you think it's not fair. You don't get to just decide for yourself what's right and what's wrong. Then who does? It was a stupid question, a question for a classroom or a philosophy discussion, not a question to be asked in the middle of an arrest, but Nock didn't have an answer for it. Her tongue pressed against the roof of her mouth while it waited for her brain to come up with the words. Behind her, in the woods above the cave, she heard voices and the sound of people crashing through the brush outside the sinkhole. She exhaled and held her staff steady. Give yourself up peacefully, she said, her voice calm once more. Pong stood in a half crouch, his knees bent like an animal ready to spring at her. Nock raised her staff. She let the nervous energy inside her pool into a ball, but then she paused. If she struck the ground with her staff, she might damage the statue. She might even cause the ceiling to cave in. Give yourself up, she repeated, and you won't be harmed. She heard familiar voices behind her. Nock called her father. She turned her head to see him climbing down the opening at the back of the cave, with villagers following behind. I'm here, father, she smiled, relieved to see him, proud that he was seeing her like this. I've got him. Nock turned back to Pong just in time to see him leap off the edge.